Do you want to talk to other Door Monster fans and us for free? You can do that in the brand new public Door Monster Discord channel. There's a link in the description. So uh, check it out and enjoy the video. This video is sponsored by Dice Dungeons. Stick around after the show for a special offer. Have you ever wanted the mirror mirror on your wall to say that you're the fairest of the everyone? Ever wanted to paint with all the palette of the breeze? Or wondered when would your reflection show what you're like within? Do you have a surplus of gizmos and gadgets but still want more? Well, have I got a happily ever after for you then? Because in 5th edition, there's rules for that. So you want to play a musical cartoon princess. Makes sense, what's not to like? You get to play a strong, motivated female character with style, confidence, potentially despotic authoritarian control over every waking aspect of your subject's lives, along with all the eternal infamy and or adoration that entails, and a heck of a singing voice. There are obviously dozens of ways we could go about doing that, but for today, let's just start with two. Well, first things first, let's figure out the most basic core qualities of what a musical cartoon princess is. That is, what is the most absolute, tiny, minimum set of features we can claim make a character recognizable as a musical cartoon princess. What is our princess skeleton? So first off, being a princess? Probably. There's definitely some room for a conversation on what strictly makes someone a princess proper, and probably even room for one about if you even have to be royal at all. But I'm gonna leave that to y'all in the comments. Nope, we're just gonna take the noble background and call it good. Next up, you 100% absolutely have to be able to sing. No exceptions, Full stop. And in fact, I would say that you not only have to be able to sing, but that you have to be able to sing so effectively that it causes actual changes in the world. And that leads us to the pretty inevitable but easy conclusion that both of our builds will have some number of bard levels. And very lastly, every musical cartoon princess needs some kind of connection to some kind of non-antagonistic animal sidekick. Honestly, looking at our source material, you get everything from fully sapient nigh humanoids all the way down to actual livestock that just has nowhere to go. So we're not gonna hard commit to any one version just yet. While we could just march out this princess skeleton with one or two more catch-all features and call it good, I think we can do better. Even if only exactly one step better. We're gonna develop this out two ways. First, we'll lean into the intersection of our character's royalty and her world-altering singing ability to come up with a personal charm slash political intrigue princess who knows her way around a spell list. And second, we'll pick up on the idea of an animal companion to help build out a princess who takes matters into her own hands and rushes out to the front lines ready for combat. All right, let's start setting up a politics princess. Our plan here is to maximize charisma and then dig, dig, dig every ounce of payoff out of it that we can. As it happens, both spellcasting and politics work best when we're able to move to a place where our enemies cannot punch us, so we'll have Dex as a secondary priority to keep us nimble. Plus, it does wonders for our dance numbers. Like I said before, Bard complements all of these goals basically perfectly, so that's what we'll do. In the first two levels of Bard, we get two class features that turn those little melodies we like to hum during our camp chores into extra value for our party. Bardic Inspiration lets us cheer on our allies in the form of a d6 they can add to an attack, save, or skill check, and Song of Rest gives out additional HP to allies using a short rest to heal up. Level 3 is pretty busy for us, and that's great. First up, Expertise lets us pump up two skills. That means one of them doesn't matter, and the other one is perform. Because if anybody deserves to hit those high notes just right every single time, it's us. Next, we finally get to enroll in the Bardic College of Glamour, and that immediately gives us two new features. We can now put on an enthralling performance, which forces an unsuspecting audience to pass a wisdom save or be charmed by us for a full hour. And if we have a rough time hosting said performance and need a bunch of friends nearby quick, we've also got Mantle of Inspiration, which lets us use Bardic Inspiration to give temporary HP and opportunity attack free reaction movement to all the allies who can see us whistling while we work. The true crown jewel of this build comes online at level 6. For a minute a day, we can use Mantle of Majesty to at last take our rightful place as queen and cast the spell command as a bonus action every turn for free. And if the target of one of these commands happens to already be charmed by us, like, say, due to a particularly enthralling recent performance, they don't even get a save. Just like that, we've gone from picking up shifts as a criminally neglected scullery maid to crafting a whole new world order. Incidentally, if someone thinks of getting clever and tries to topple our empire by encharming our own party out from under us, we've also just picked up Counter Charm to snap him out of it. As one last note to finish off our political power queen, let's look at a few spells worth having. Charm Person is a duh, and we've already gotten our mileage out of command, but never underestimate just how much bloodshed you can avoid by casting Calm Emotions or Zone of Truth at just just the right moment. And just to check off that one last core princess quality, what better way is there to send official missives throughout the land than with Animal Messenger, huh? 
All right, let's get back to our princess skeleton to work in a very different direction and build up a frontline battle princess. Step one, three levels of ranger. To be extra specific, three levels of the unearthed arcana revised ranger, because those updates are going to be particularly helpful for us. This time around, we care a bit more about being suited up for the rage of close combat, so let's flip our priorities on dex and charisma and pick up a finesse weapon. We get to pick a ranger fighting style at level two. I would suggest defense to help make up for the d8 hit dice we'll be picking up soon, but some characters will definitely have a good case for archery. Our first real pickup, however, is the perfectly tailored combo package of Natural Explorer and Primeval Awareness. At level 1, Natural Explorer does for us pretty much exactly what you'd expect it to. Thanks to the countless hours we spent in our formative years foraging, hunting, and dancing our way across one wilderness or another, we are both completely immune to rough terrain and literally unable to become lost in the natural world. Then, at level 3, we awaken a primeval awareness that lets us innately communicate with every single critter, runabout, and wing of a thing of the world as kindred spirits. And I mean, that is pretty cool, you know? But there's just no telling how far a squirrel will go along with a conversation about all of your princess problems before completely losing interest the same way people do. What we need is wildlife that we can force into being emotionally invested in our struggles. And that's exactly what we get from joining the Beast Conclave. We're supposed to pick a very specific kind of animal companion from a very limited list, but if our DM has put up with this character concept for this long, I have to imagine they'll probably be okay with reimagining one of these stat blocks as our dream pet. Whatever it ends up being, our companion is no slouch. It gets its own movement, its own attacks, even its own spot in the initiative. It's nearly an entire second mini PC, and that's going to help us out a ton when at last we see a fight. At this point, we are almost there on our concept of a rough and tumble adventure battle princess. From level 4 and on, we dive back into Bard. Levels 1 and 2 we take the same as before, but once we get to level 3, we will join the College of Valor. For doing so, we get Combat Inspiration, which allows our party member to add any inspiration dice we give them to the two combat numbers that they couldn't before, damage rolls and AC. And that's a good thing, because apparently those two are the important ones. So there we go, two royal women with life-changingly excellent singing and a way with animals both definitely card-carrying cartoon musical princesses, and both with completely different strengths, roles, and motives. And neither of which, now that I think about it, possess any ability to provide government administration or guidance whatsoever. Anyway, I'm sure there will be those of you that think I have totally missed what these cartoon musical princesses are really about. And to that, I say... Let it go. Let it go. Ooh, that's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, and this is the part where I talk about the video that wasn't this video, it was the last video, which was close to a week ago. Actually, we're getting better. Uh, the last video was using reach weapons in Pathfinder. Huge number of suggestions, and I just wanted to go over a few of them and why I didn't pick some of them. So the number one feat I saw mentioned was Stand Still, which looks super, super cool, because it looks like anybody time somebody comes into your threatened range, you can just bam, stop them, and they just don't go anywhere, which is exactly what we were trying to do, right? The problem with Stand Still is that it actually, in the text, says adjacent squares and not threatened squares. So we can have a reach out to the moon, but they still gotta be right next to us for a standstill to work, which sucks. Ask your DM, they may be like, hey, that sucks, why not? Uh, speaking of sucks, a lot of you suggested whips. I would love to make whips work. Whips take so much effort to make work. The problem with whips is they have a natural 15 foot reach, which is great, but they don't actually threaten any of it. Uh, they do non-lethal damage. Sometimes you can get away with using a scorpion whip. That's really, really table dependent because scorpion whip rules don't actually work. Uh, Pizer just kind of ignored it. But technically what you're supposed to do is take whip mastery and then improve whip mastery, and then you threaten five feet and then another five feet. So you're still only at 10 feet after two feet and you're using a whip. I can't make whips work it very easily. And then last, the dreaded second diagonal. A lot of you called me out on this, and that's fine. So in the donut shapes, you'll see that there is two solid squares around the character when they get large. Technically speaking, the second diagonal is 15 feet and not 10 feet, because in Pathfinder, your first diagonal counts as five, and your second counts as 10, so you get 15 feet over the course of the diagonal. And technically, you're supposed to like cut in those little squares because the measurement actually runs out in the middle of the square, blah, blah, blah. I let my players threaten the second diagonal. Soon. It's really just table dependent. Um, Just make sure that you know how your DM is going to run it when it comes up, and then it's fine as long as it's consistent. We'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, DiceDungeons.com. You can use our code DOORMONSTER on their website to get 10% off your order. They've got a bunch of great stuff there. They have marble dice, they have metal dice, they have little tokens for your characters, like little coins that fit on battle maps. They have cloth battle maps. They also have these gorgeous rosewood boxes, and uh, I think it's all great. You should go look around and use our code DOORMONSTER to get 10% off. DiceDungeons.com. Do it. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching this one, watch the next one, and the one after that. I won't make any promises about the third one.